Well, I mean, it's like you, the, the guys in the band and myself, we're all around the same age, you know, we're in our, our 50s and, and there's one member, not myself, who's a little bit older now. <laughs> this is if we tease, and, uh, but we're getting there. Uh, you know, we grew up listening to music in the 60s. I mean, my, my parents had a great record collection when I was coming up in the early 60s, listening to the music that they had. They had, you know, Sarah Vaughan, they had Ray Charles. We had, we had a lot of the pop singers who, for us, were like Bobby Bland and Sam Cooke and Jackie Wilson and all that stuff. So in our household, we had all kinds of cool music. Then the Beatles came out. And uh, I wanted to be George Harrison, so I got a guitar. You know, I begged Mom for a guitar, and I got an acoustic guitar first off. I got a Harmony Sovereign to start off with, and then after a while I got a Harmony Electric with one pickup on it. But... But when I got that guitar, you know, it was like it wasn't just the Beatles music. I was listening to radio. So, and radio in, in the States was back in, in the mid 60s was, you know, it had R&B, it had Motown and the Beatles, you know, and everything was on. You just leave it on one station and whatever we could pick up, we would, you know, try to play. So we had no, you know, concept of all these, you know, separate genres of music. If you like the song, it was cool. And uh, I, I kept that in my head as a youngster learning to play guitar until I, I had some friends in high school who started listening to people like Buddy Guy and Magic Sam and Howlin' Wolf and Muddy Waters. And at 16, 16 years old, when I started listening to the music, it was, I don't think I had absorbed some of the blues that was played at home because it was a it was a reawakening, you know. Hearing, you know, you know, these guys with these cool nicknames, you know, Muddy Waters, Howlin' Wolf, Magic Sam and all that stuff. So we got into that and listening to Hubert Sumlin and Buddy Guy and all. But you know, I'd already heard Eric Clapton and, and uh, Jimi Hendrix too, because I saw Hendrix twice when I because I lived up in Seattle, I saw Hendrix twice, so I was already into here and all that stuff. And uh, so, you know, we started listening to all that music. And then that's when our friends who, who were, the other friends who weren't playing guitar were around us listening to all this other kinds of music, kind of separated us into this cast group where these guitar players were, are you guys, man, you're listening to that blues, that blues, that stuff, you know. But as guitar players, we were hearing a different thing. And uh, so um, that we went there. And then I, I can say for, for a little while, I was obsessed with listening to the blues thing. And I wouldn't listen to anything else because I was so absorbed. And so were the people around me. And then after a while, I, I reopened the book again and started listening to the wide world of music again. So then the Stax music came in and, and all the other things that I had absorbed earlier on. And so I think that's what got me into to where we are now. Well, for, first of all, the thing that I enjoyed about working with Kevin was I had the "Man, get off of my shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> it was great because I, I wasn't producing. And uh, the thing about our band is uh, our drummer, Tony Braunigal is a producer. Jim Pugh, our keyboard player, is a producer, <laughs> and Richard's produced in the past before. So actually, when I was doing producing, everybody was producing, and there was too many, you know, too many cooks. <laughs> so when Kevin came in, Kevin took over, and it was great, because Kevin had, it was great, because we had never worked with Kevin. I had met Kevin in a couple, you know, a couple, few different uh, uh, meetings before going into the studio, and... Um, and, and, and found out how he likes to work. And he said, I like to work really fast. Don't like to dwell on anything for a long period of time. Otherwise, we'll go to something else. That's the way I've always enjoyed doing it. We got into the studio, started working with Kevin, and go, this guy's on the, on the ball. He knows his stuff. And uh, we went to work, and, you know, Kevin, you know, would say, you know, let's try this again. We, you know, we'd, you know, do a you know, stronger take or something like that. And I'll be, had all these rhythmic ideas. It was great, you know, and, and moved and motivated us and, and uh, moved quick. I mean, we went into the studio and we were, we were out in two weeks. 
The thing that was great about going into the studio also is we had done a 12-day run as the band. Got home on a Sunday. Monday, we went straight into rehearsals. Nobody had heard any of the material that we were going to record. We all presented our material. We spent a week rehearsing. Finished on a Saturday. Sunday, we moved the gear into the studio. Monday, we started recording. Bam, boom, boom. Just like that. You know, I've pretty much done the same thing. So I have, I've always had the amp in its little locker room, you know. One thing that I did have fun doing when we recorded uh, the album this time, which was our last, before this new one, uh, studio recording, we did the song Chicken in the Kitchen. And, uh, you know, you have a, a close-up mic on the amp and then you have one a little bit far away. That's what... We, we all normally did. We listened to the playback and said, what the hell? That sound is fantastic. Oh, the close-up mic wasn't on. <laughs> and it was getting more of the room sound. And so when that solo starts out, I mean, it, it was like, and I can't remember, I think I was playing through a, um, a super reverb on that one. And the sound was like just kicking, and I and I was and and I'd forgotten this time to maybe try that effect again. But I liked the the distant sound, depending on the room size the amp was in, for something. But other than that, it's the same thing. I mean, you know, we record together as a group. All, all always we play live together, and then you know then I might go and and um, either add a rhythm track or a solo track. Sometimes I play the solo while we're cutting live. I did that on a couple of these. Um, but that's, that's, that's the only thing. I, I, one revelation that hit me when we were doing the same, no, not this time, but I think an album before then, was we had been in an A room once at this bigger studio, and we moved to the B room to do overdubs, and this rock group took over the A room and during a break for us in the B room I was walking through the hallway and I ran into one of the guys who was working in the A room one of the band members we were talking he says oh yeah we're recording I said oh I hear the drums in there through the wall he says well how? He, he said the drummer's in there doing his tracks I go what do you mean <laughs> don't you play together so no 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 we we do everything separately and that threw me that some record individually. I've never done that. Never tried it? No, I don't see how that works. When you, how can you lock into a groove when you're not all playing together? That, that's weird. <laughs> the, the main guitar I play is, is, a, is a Sunburst Strat like this. This isn't the particular one I used in the studio, but it's, it's like this. It's the same setup. It's the, from the custom shop that we, you know, we um, put together. I think it came out because I started working with Fender in like 89. I was contacted by a, a guy who used to work there by the name of John Grunder. And uh, we went through, we went and we modeled it after two strats that I own. One is a 58 Sunburst. That's the one that's on the cover of Strong Persuader. That, that's a 58, but that had a maple neck. And then I had a 64 Strat that had a rosewood neck and so we worked to try to get the right radius that you know between the two of them and, and we worked on that and uh, then some you know uh, pickups that are, are wound uh, from through the custom shop as well and then after that you know um, just the rest is cosmetic basically what's the first thing you play when you pick up a guitar the first thing i play I don't know. <laughs> I just pick it up just to feel it, you know. And 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 uh, you know, it's, I always pl it's hard for me not to play without vibrato. I'm just so used to doing that. So I just you know just that's what I do. And I think more. I kind of like you know. It kind of reminds me like. The old seasoned singer with that has vibrato and it's kind of over exaggerated, you know, like 
That I think that's how my playing is going these days because I find myself playing the vibrato and bending the strings like an old person singing. And almost to the point, sometimes I think of almost pulling it out of, out of tune. <laughs> and I catch myself on occasion doing that. What about your right hand? Are you, are you always pick and fingers? You know, just play with fingers? Or... I, um, I don't just play with fingers on, on, on their own, but if, if you're looking for like a more warmer sound, yeah, then, you know, I'll, I'll tuck the pick under and just and do that. Or sometimes, you know, pull. You know, more percussive and more pulling sound, so. Most of the time for rhythm, I'll be here. A little bit brighter sound is here, but I prefer playing more, more of the rhythms here. And then f the fourth position for most of my solos. Although, you know, certain songs I'll, I'll play in this position for the solo. Then, you know, when you go up high. And that's, that's probably it. I don't care so much for this middle position. <laughs> I don't see any point in it. <laughs> I use an 11 for my E string, and then I go to a 13, then an 18 plane, and a 36, 46, no, 36, no, 38, 36, 46, 18, 28, 36, 46, there you go, 28, 36, 46. Yeah, I forget, it's not one of the jazz guitars. But um, to me, you know, that's, that's a good feel because I can get some sound out of the 11, you know, and I, I couldn't use anything any lighter. And uh, I guess you would say my action is high because I need to get under the strings, you know, uh, when, I'm, when I'm pulling. So anything lower than what this action is, and it's, you know, it's, I, I guess compared to somebody who might be playing on a Les Paul, this is high action, you know. Do you, and with such a physical technique and such, um, such a lot of vibrato, do you go through frets? Yeah. Probably have to have it redone after a good six months of playing, yeah, yeah. Yeah, frets, you, got, you just have to forget about that and just use the workhorse as it is. When they go, you got, you got to have it redone. So. <laughs>